The following program is a special presentation of the Big Ten Network, produced in association with the University of Wisconsin. Every day seems to bring a spate of bad economic news. Unemployment rates are soaring, home foreclosures are skyrocketing, businesses, large and small, are closing their doors. How did this economic crisis get so bad? How much worse will it get? And can President Obama's stimulus plan provide any needed relief? We'll tackle these fundamental questions with two experts from the University of Wisconsin, next, during office hours. I'm Ken Goldstein, professor of political science at the University of Wisconsin-Madison. Today, we're taking a look at the recent developments in our national economy with two Wisconsin experts, Mike Knetter and Morris Davis. Mike is Dean of the Wisconsin School of Business and was a senior staff economist to George H.W. Bush and Bill Clinton. Morris is a professor in the Real Estate and Urban Land Economics Department here at University of Wisconsin-Madison. He was also on the senior staff of the Federal Reserve Board from 2002 to 2006. Gentlemen, welcome. Mike, let's cut right to the chase. How bad is the current economic situation and what are the numbers that you're looking at? Well, it's pretty bad. You know, since we're in office hours, let me put it this way. Remember when the fall semester started, early September, the days were a little bit longer, it was sunny, kind of warm. Think about what it's like right now. We're in the middle of winter, got wind chills 20 below zero. The economy's kind of tracked Wisconsin weather, I'd say, pretty carefully since September 1st. Now, we'll be lucky if it does that over the next four months. Uh, what we've seen happen over the last four months of 2008 was very alarming. I think a big increase in the rate of job destruction in the economy. So relative to the number of jobs we had at the peak of the expansion in employment, we've lost 1.5 percent of the total number of jobs in the economy in just the last four months. In all of 2008, we lost a total of 2 percent. So the first eight months was a half a percent of total employment that we lost. Yeah, we were in recession, but it wasn't that bad. Now things have really deteriorated sharply toward the end of the year, and I think we're really in the, in the dead of winter right now in our economy. So I look at the employment numbers as a major indicator of health. Uh, obviously, GDP goes along with that, and we finally had a quarter of uh, very deep contraction uh, in Q4 2008. Morris, what's your read on the current situation? What are the indicators that you tend to focus on? Well, like Mike, I focus on production, which is GDP, and employment, or unemployment in this case. But also another indicator of how bad things are for everyone is the, what's happened to wealth. Typically, we think of high income and high wealth uh, folks as perhaps being insulated from the effects of the business cycle. But in this particular downturn, high wealth individuals have lost a lot of their wealth. Uh, House prices are down about 30 percent from their peak in mid-2006, and then the stock market is down 40, 45 percent from just September. Or what does that 30, 45 percent translate into in terms of real dollars? Well, in terms of aggregate wealth, we've lost close to $10 trillion of aggregate wealth when you add up the declines in house values and the declines in the stock market. And the people that held that wealth tended to be the richest Americans. So even they have felt the pain of this economic contraction. So $10 trillion is obviously a staggering number. We read in the press, we listen in the media that this is the worst economic downturn since the Great Depression, much worse than any other situation we've had. Mike, can you put this into context a little bit? It's not the first recession we've had. No, uh, you know, but we'd gotten kind of overconfident, I think, about our ability to manage recessions or our economy's resilience. That was a word people used to describe the U.S. economy quite frequently in the last decade. You know, we kind of weathered the dot-com crash fairly well. Um, so, you know, it seems like business cycles had gotten progressively milder since the 82-83 recession. So this one, I think, caught people by surprise, although some, some folks in the financial markets felt this was coming. I, I think they could see the credit crunch coming. How, how does this compare to the 82-83 recession? Well, you know, as I was saying, I think the employment numbers we're seeing now are starting to track pretty closely with what was going on in that downturn. Now, we don't know how things are going to unfold the next few months. It, it looks like things may be deteriorating a little bit more sharply in January, but I think we may be, you know, going to start to bottom out fairly soon. Uh, the one thing I'd say in our defense, you know, when, when, I, when I try to look at the good side of our economy, 
In 82, 83, I think people had really lost a lot of faith in our ability to be a world economic leader. Uh, in that downturn, you know, we were, we were really taking big hits in autos and steel. And at that time, I think people thought those were the most important industries in America. And in the depths of that recession, I don't think people thought we could reassert any dominance in those sectors. And I think many, many folks were convinced that Germany, Japan, uh, other European countries, other developed economies would really eclipse us as the economic superpowers. And one of the heartening things is, you know, from 1984 to 2005, if you look at what happened, the U.S. really created uh, what we now call the knowledge economy. So in the depths of recession in 82, 83, we didn't know where the jobs were going to be coming out of that. And the interesting thing is the market kind of worked its magic and capital flowed to some new sectors that have become very important worldwide. And one great thing about where we sit today is I still think the U.S. is in a very strong position in the technology industries. And I still believe that technology is the wave of the future. So I think we're at least in a strong position in terms of industry structure, but we've got to find a way to heal ourselves and, and kind of get, get the you know, gears greased better again and get the economy moving. Great, thanks. When we come back, we're going to get into a lot more detail about how we go about, how we go about that healing process. Thanks for joining us on Office Hours. We'll be right back. This program is a production of the University of Wisconsin-Madison. If you have comments about this broadcast, please email them to programming at uc.wisc.edu. Consider this. There's a public university that consistently ranks among the top in the number of Peace Corps volunteers and in the number of graduates serving as CEOs of Fortune 500 companies, whether they are leading corporations or changing the world. The next time you see people doing extraordinary things, they are probably badgers. The University of Wisconsin-Madison. Forward thinking. Welcome back to Office Hours. Our topic today, what's on everyone's mind, the state of the economy. So Morris, the previous segment at the end there, even on this cold, wintry day in Wisconsin, Mike gave us a pretty positive or optimistic picture of the potential for the U.S. economy. Do you share his optimism? Absolutely. Uh, over long periods of time, real GDP growth is uh, determined by how fast we innovate as a society. And there's no reason to believe that our capacity to innovate has been slowed down by uh, what appears to be just a deep recession. However, there are certain aspects of this recession that have me very concerned. The 82 recession was a deep contract, it was a deep recession, but it followed uh, the decade of the 70s, which were relatively turbulent economic times. So to, to have a, a deep recession follow a turbulent decade is not that much of a surprise. Starting in 1985, we entered a period that economists have called the great moderation. Uh, GDP growth just was not very volatile. And uh, economists had openly been talking that recessions were dead, or, or at least the old school, the 1982 style recessions were dead. One, there are a few explanations for why uh, recessions may not have, um, may not be manifested in the future, but one common explanation was that financial markets had made it easier for us to allocate risks in the economy and therefore smoothed production possibilities. So what some of us find disturbing about this recession is it appears to have been the outcome of the misallocation of risks by the financial sector. So exactly the same group of uh, people that are supposed to be smoothing out risk and allocating risk appropriately appears they may have act, the, the lack of proper allocation of risk might have actually been associated with this very deep recession. Okay, so even if we think the long, long term, we can be fairly optimistic. We're still in a deep problem now. Mm -hmm. We have a stimulus package currently being debated in Congress to try and jumpstart the economy, put the, put the, put the cables on, on the patient. Mm -hmm. What exactly is that stimulus package trying to do? What can $850 billion do? Well, $850 billion, this just in, is a lot of money, okay? <laughs> 
even in an economy our size, that's, that's a whopping amount of new spending to inject. Now it'll take time for that money to get out and get to work. Um, so what we're trying to do is, I think, put more spending power in consumers' pockets through tax cuts, um, do more spending through the public sector, uh, tackle some infrastructure projects that some folks would argue are past due and necessary and important. And through that, I think, start to put a little bit of a floor under this deceleration we've seen. So um, after the stock market fell so much, consumers got very concerned about the future, started to reduce their spending, increase their saving, you know, put it aside for a rainy day, and something's got to take the place of that sharp contraction in consumption spending if you want to smooth out uh, activity in the economy. And so the idea of the stimulus is just that government will somehow come in and pick up some of that slack or induce consumers to start spending more through a tax cut. And I think the tax cut's a little risky right now. There's a good chance people will use that to just repair their balance sheets. So. Morris, what do we know about that? We know the stimulus package is a combination of trying to put, put shovels in the ground on some public works projects, on some tax cuts, and on some longer-term parts of Obama's, uh, Obama's plan. But what's the relative value of a tax cut dollar versus putting a shovel in the ground right now? What do we know about that? Well, this is a great question. So there, let's say there's three parts to the stimulus plan. The first part is to raise money at the federal level to replace money that's not being raised at the state level. States have to balance their budgets. Tax revenues at the state level are falling, so absent any intervention from the federal government, state and local government spending would fall. So one way to prevent that is to just transfer resources from the federal government, which does not have to run a balanced budget, to the state and local governments. So uh, that's one part of the stimulus package, and I think most economists agree that's a perfectly sensible thing to do. Now the other two parts to the stimulus package, one is a tax cut, and the other is government spending on infrastructure. The tax cut, there are arguments that you can make for and against tax cuts. So let me put that aside. Some people feel strongly that we shouldn't be cutting taxes when we're already running a deficit. Other people say that's exactly the right time to cut taxes. Um, but let's talk about the government infrastructure plan. If, we, if new roads and bridges will actually add to the productive capacity of the U.S. workforce, then you can view the infrastructure plan as an investment in our future. And therefore, and you could argue it's a sensible investment. The construction sector has seen a lot of job loss, and there are a lot of skilled people that do not have jobs in the construction industry. So one idea is take those folks that are currently unemployed and have them employed, employ them working on bridges that add to our productive capacity. That's the strongest case that you can make for infrastructure spending. Let me, let me, let me jump in here. Yep. We've got to go to another break, and then I want to hear the, uh, the end of that thought. Okay. So please come right back to us in office hours. For more than 100 years, the University of Wisconsin has been inspired by the Wisconsin idea. Which says the good work of the university extends to the boundaries of the state and beyond. So the UW works hard to help build Wisconsin's economy. Educate people of all ages. Advance health and medicine. And enhance the quality of life for all of us. Hit it! The University of Wisconsin-Madison. Forward thinking. Welcome back to Office Hours. Speaking with Morris Davis and Mike Kinetter. Morris, finish that last thought. If we do this stimulus package, if we do start doing all these infrastructure projects, is, is, is there any danger in that? Sure, there's a downside to this. So the upside is that we repair bridges that need to be repaired, and that adds to our productive capacity. The downside is that the government builds bridges that are unproductive. They build bridges to nowhere, or they repave roads that have already been repaved last year. So the downside to the stimulus is that we waste resources that do not add to our productive capacity. And, and that would just be money thrown away. So I'm watching television, and they're telling me we're in this problem because we spent too much the last five years, and now I'm being told we need to spend more to get the economy going again. Explain that to me, Mike. Well, that's the great irony of the situation we're in right now, and it's a good thing we've elected a president who I think is a pretty persuasive individual. So, I, you know, it's ironic, but I think uh, those folks who 
you know, believe a stimulus package can work, will say, yeah, that, that is exactly what we need to do right now, and that, in fact, households have gotten so spooked and maybe so obsessed with rebuilding their balance sheets after the collapse in equity prices and real estate values that they're trying to do it in one year. And if, you know, it's sort of like a macroeconomic prisoner's dilemma. And, you know, the prisoner's dilemma is a little game where you, you catch two people in a crime and you separate them and you try to get them to think on each other and they get the best outcome if they both hold tough and don't tell. But they know that if the other guy tells and they don't, they're in worse shape. We're a little bit that way with the economy right now. Uh, it'd be nice if all households could say, you know, let's take our time. We'll rebuild our balance sheets over 10 years. We don't need to overdo the saving right now. But of course, everyone would like to cheat on that and put more money in the market now and rebuild their own balance sheet and not be the ones that are spending to keep others employed. So we're in this situation where people have lost confidence. They're not spending. They're trying to rebuild their balance sheets, um, you know, I guess arguably too quickly, and the government's trying to step in and pick up that slack, and in the process by maybe putting a little bit of a break on the job loss, restoring a little bit of confidence. And I think that the whole trick for the Obama administration is to model the rebuilding of their fiscal house, you know, put the government's fiscal house in order over a 10-year horizon, not a one-year horizon, and compel households to do the same thing. That'd be the best outcome. Okay. When we come back in our next segment, I want to pick up on a couple things Mike just said and get into a discussion of the banking system. You talked about President Obama's ability to communicate. And you talked about personal, uh, uh, the balance sheet of, of personal households. Well, the balance sheet of banks looks pretty grim now, uh, and it seems to be that both the banks and even the Obama administration is not doing a particularly compelling job of explaining to people why the banking system is important and how important a role that's going to play in getting us out. So please join us in Office Hours in our next segment. This program is a production of the University of Wisconsin-Madison. If you have comments about this broadcast, please email them to programming at uc.wisc.edu. Welcome back to Office Hours. Morris Davis, Mike Knetter, joining us today in Studio A to talk about the economy. Morris, let's turn and talk about the, the banking system. Why is a healthy banking system so important to the American economy? Well, I'll tell you what banks should do. Banks should take money from people that want to loan out money, and they should lend it to people that need to borrow, and that's efficient. Uh, you shouldn't have people looking for investment opportunities from other people. There should be a centralized place where exchange and intermediation takes place. So in a healthy banking system, the banks simply allocate funds from people that want to loan to people that want to borrow. Uh, how did, how did that break down? Well, sounds, uh, sounds straightforward. What's the problem? Yeah, banks are basically refusing to intermediate right now. And I think the reason they're refusing to intermediate is because uh, they're afraid that whoever they might loan to would refuse to pay them back. And uh, they also might be refusing to intermediate because their own balance sheet isn't healthy enough to allow them to lend very much. So the banking system's broken both because healthy banks are afraid to lend because they're, they don't know who they're lending to or the credit worthiness of who they're lending to. And unhealthy banks don't, uh, are afraid to lend because they're not sure how many resources they have on hand to lend. Mike, t t talk to me a little bit more about why they're afraid to, to lend. TARP, $700 billion, $350 mm -hmm. billion, dollars, much of that has already gone to the four largest banks. Mm -hmm. Why aren't they lending that money? You know, it, it, the economy's changed so much in the last four or five months that I think what's going on is, is the process of price discovery. And I think we still don't know what the right interest rates are. So the economy's changed so much, banks' assessment of credit risk of borrowers has changed a lot. And the potential borrowers may think, hey, my credit situation isn't that bad. You know, a year and a half ago, I could have gotten this loan for 5%, uh, and now you want 9%. 
I'm not going to borrow at that rate. So, you know, I think healthy banks may be having a hard time finding borrowers at the rates they're willing to lend at, giving, given their assessment of the credit risks out there. So I, I think there's a little bit of the supply side, as Morris was saying, some banks are constrained because their capital ratios aren't adequate to you know, enable them to lend much. Others are maybe in a situation where they could lend, but there's a disagreement between the lenders and borrowers about what the right price is. Some, some people, especially on the conservative side, are saying that the culprit in a lot of this is, is mark to market. Tell me a little bit about what that means and why that might have some sort of impact on, on, on whether the banks are willing to loan now. Mark to market means that uh, when a firm does its reporting, all of the assets on its books and all of the liabilities have to be stated at, mark to mar at, at market values, such that if the firm were forced to sell everything right now, you'd note exactly how much the assets were worth and exactly how much the liabilities are worth. The, the, uh, the people that do not like mark to market say that a lot of the assets that are held by banks are illiquid, so they're hard to price immediately. And the, these same folks also say that uh, the price of risk is at a historic high. So uh, the people that they would be selling to simply don't want to, don't want to incur any risks right now, so they wouldn't be willing to pay very much. So there's a discrepancy between the risk tolerance of the people that would buy the assets and the risk tolerance of the people that invest in the bank. And so the people that do not like mark-to-market think that it paints an inappropriate picture of the true worth of the assets and liabilities on the bank's balance sheet. But Mike, what's the other option? Then the other option is Bank A could say that my loan's worth $70 and Bank B could say my loan's $80 and if I'm an investor, how do I know what the truth is? It's a great question, Ken, and I think we'll be debating mark-to-market accounting for quite some time. You know, I mean, it's hard to argue against valuing an asset at what you could sell it for today, but we're finding out that in the current environment, you know, a lot of people do feel like maybe that's exaggerating the problems. Uh, we've got very illiquid markets and it's making bank capital ratios very low. I've heard some people claim that, you know, in the, in the Latin American debt crisis, if we'd had mark-to-market accounting, a lot of banks would have never survived. Dangerous thing to say to an academic, you each have 15 seconds. If you had Barack Obama's Blackberry, what would you be telling him right now? Keep up the great work. Keep up the great work. <laughs> no other more specific advice? Actually, the only advice I would offer is that we've created money at a, this is not something Barack Obama can control, but we've created money at an unprecedented pace and that uh, we should just watch the rate of growth of money creation because there's the potential for inflation down the road. Given you Barack Obama's BlackBerry address, what do you say to him? Go back to business school. Go back to business school here <laughs> sure. at the University of Wisconsin-Madison. Yeah, no, be out in front. Um, he's a great leader. He's a great persuader. I think, you know, part of the president's role is to give people confidence at a time like this, and I think he's capable of that. Mike Kinnetter, Morris Davis, thanks so much for joining us today for this discussion on the economy. And thanks to all of you for joining us today on Office Hours. And I hope you'll join us again next time. The preceding program was produced by the University of Wisconsin in association with the Big Ten Network.